St. Andrews is in the ancient kingdom of Fife. And every inch of it is haunted by history. A few miles to the south is a bustling new town, Glenrothes. It has attracted industry from all over the world. It is building up a base for expansion in Britain and in Europe. A few miles to the north of St. Andrews, the majestic Tay Bridge links Fife with an older industrial centre in Dundee. But those who prefer to drop into St. Andrews use Lucas Air Terminal, five miles from the centre of the borough. Why do they come? Not just for the golf or the beaches, Nowhere in the world does a university dominate a city as here. Relations between the students and the 10,000 local citizens are good. St. Andrews continues a quiet, unspoiled place, but a place in which great things happen, a place where ideas to shape the future are born. It has been so for more than five and a half centuries. This ancient and precious document is the charter of the university. It is precious in a special sense, for St. Andrews is the oldest of Scotland's ancient universities. Its historic associations are vividly portrayed by the survival of many of its medieval buildings and customs. Each spring, the Kate Kennedy procession recalls the history of the university and the borough. The university has survived critical periods and come out of them stronger. In 1558, it came within a hair's breadth of extinction, when in the whole university only three students could be counted. In our own day, in 1967, it lost more than half its students, taken to form the new University of Dundee. Overnight, this left less than 1,900 students. The whole administration was made uneconomic. Overheads were then too great for our numbers. Such social sciences as psychology, for example, were reduced to a rudimentary state. By its own efforts, it immediately did much to remedy this. It raised numbers by 30%. It set out a development plan and redefined its purposes as an independent institution with public duties. It remains small, but distinguished. And yet, for all its smallness, it is an international university drawing nearly half its numbers from outside Scotland. Thirty-six different countries are represented in the student body at the present time. University Hall was opened in 1896 
and was probably the first women's hall of residence in Scotland. Development continues. And one of the attractions of St Andrews University may be that almost half its students are girls. But the special virtues of St Andrews start, of course, with a high intellectual standard. A healthy rate of applications maintains this. It is a place for close relations between seniors and juniors. It's a real living organism, not just a place where learning is imparted. The new Andrew Melville Hall of Residence accommodates 250 students and is the first mixed hall of its kind in St Andrews. The two study bedroom wings achieve the objects of providing maximum views and sunlight to rooms. The vitality and sense of movement thus imparted contrasts strongly with the stability of form assured by the central block of communal accommodation. St. Sylvetus Hall was built as a residence for male students in 1930 and now has accommodation for nearly 140. The study bedrooms have views either over the Garden Quadrangle or the magnificent St. Andrew's Bay. Dean's Court is part of the College of St. Leonard's. The old College of St. Leonard's was suspended in the middle of the 18th century. It is now revived for a new purpose for graduate studies where people in science and the arts and in social studies will mix. Hamilton Hall overlooks the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, where the rules of the game as we know them today were first formulated. The coastline around St Andrews is a special attraction to geologists and marine biologists and field courses are frequently organised. The greatest obstacle to growth is now the lack of accommodation. The town is completely saturated. The university has taken up the challenge and is building halls like the David Russell Hall as fast as it can find the money. It is a slow uphill fight and more money is required to ensure the growth in the student numbers upon which the other plans depend. The university is on the move. It cannot let anything check it now. A further development to be known as Ganicke House will be finished in 1971, an addition to St. Salvatus Hall community. The three disciplines of chemistry, mathematics and physics are the foundation stones for all science students and the buildings for these three basic sciences are the ones at present completed on the North Hall. Close circuit television has been installed and the extensive lecture theatre complex in these buildings makes them ideal for large meetings and conferences. Plans are however being drawn up for further buildings to cater for geology and the complex of subjects under the heading Life Sciences. The computer at present in operation in IBM 360 incorporates the most modern developments in computational science. Laser radiation is of blinding intensity and to generate it from electrical discharges and gases requires high voltages. The argon lasers studied at St Andrews are used for micro-machining in the manufacture of electronic circuits of computers and for taking the 3D photographs known as holograms.
The association of the university with astronomy goes back about 300 years to the great figure of James Gregory, who was the contemporary and friend of Sir Isaac Newton. Gregory occupied the Regis Chair of Mathematics and is generally regarded as the first designer of the reflecting telescopes. The observatory created at St. Andrews by James Gregory was one of the first university observatories in the world. The modern observatory was built in 1941 and is the largest university observatory in Britain. It includes therein a 37-inch Cass Green Schmidt telescope and this is the second largest telescope in Britain. In 1964, the Buchanan Arts Building was completed and now provides the main accommodation for language departments. It is situated within medieval St. Andrews. The three main streets of the old walled town converge on the main doorway of the ruined cathedral. From its consecration in 1318, this was the heart of religious life in Scotland. St. Andrews by the Northern Sea, a haunted place that is for me. St. Mary's College, completed in 1540, shows the influence of the French craftsmen who came from Falkland, Paris, to assist in the building. In this perfect setting, divinity is taught. St. Salvator's College Tower and Collegiate Church were built in the period 1450-1460. The university's medieval foundation and long history gives it a sense of proportion in all its discussions. It played a big part in the Scottish Reformation. John Knox preached from the pulpit, which is in this chapel. And it was the case that nearly everyone in public life in Scotland in the 1670s had been educated here. One of the traditions to survive the passage of time is the student's peer walk, which takes place after Sunday morning services. Graduation is the highlight in the university calendar, a time for reflection of the achievements to date and of the challenges still lying ahead. For many, it's a time for a last reunion before the parting of the ways. As the university enters a new decade, what are its aims? One is constant. It is to make St. Andrews more effectively a leading influence in Britain we believe that our student numbers must be raised to the lowest figure which is economically viable for a first-class, internationally ranked university. And our calculation of that figure, which is the same as the Robbins Committee, is somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 students. We intend to fix the target at 4,000. That's the first thing we must do. We must also rebuild those departments which have been reduced or have gone out of existence after the separation with Dundee in order to give the right range of subjects. We must also develop graduate studies, keeping them intimately connected with undergraduate teaching. And we must add to the variety of life with our art center in St. Andrews. To achieve these aims, we must build more student residences and flats.
And by doing so, we will ensure that the close social life which has existed among staff and students over countless generations will be preserved for posterity. ruins land to St. Andrews a timeless quality, yet its life is continually renewed. Horizons change, though the achievements of men remain. With your help, the decade of the 1970s will be remembered as a time of new prosperity for the university, in which it achieved distinction rivaling the greatest periods in its long history. <laughs>